just so just this background, Sri Lanka is a democratic republic with a multi-party system. Uh, as you can see from the map, it's located on an island that's approximately 25 miles from the southeast tip of India. The population is estimated to be about 20 million. It's composed of a Sinhalese majority and minority Tamil and Muslim groups. Sinhalese are mostly Buddhist, while the Tamils are mostly Hindu. Uh, there's a Christian minority of both the Sinhalese and the Tamil groups as well. After independence from Great Britain in 1948, successive Sinhalese-dominated governments took steps to redress what they felt to be an imbalance in favor of the Tamils derived from the British colonial period. Major issues concern language, what well, was going to be the official language of the country, land, who got access to land, how was land being distributed, and access to government employment and higher education. The Tamil minority felt increasingly marginalized and sought autonomy for the northeast of the country, which was seen by the Tamils as their traditional homeland. After decades of peaceful agitation failed to achieve any result, Tamil political parties in 1976 called for an independent Tamil state in the Northeast. Tamil youth joined militant groups and began attacking the security forces. The conflict escalated in 1983 into full-scale civil war. After fighting among different Tamil militant groups, the Liberation Tigers and Tamil Elam, often called Tamil Tigers, emerged as the dominant separatist group. Decades of fighting between the government forces and the Tigers produced no conclusive result, with neither side being strong enough to defeat the other, with attempts at peace talks repeatedly failed. The war ended, as the film showed, finally in May of 2009, with the government's military victory over the Tigers. During the decades of the war, the Sri Lankan security forces committed thousands of human rights violations against unarmed Tamils who were suspected to be supporters or members of the Tigers, including arbitrary detention, torture, extra judicial execution, sometimes called political killing, and enforced disappearances. In particular, enforced disappearances appear to be used for two purposes. The facilitated torture without accountability and a concealed killing of prisoners. It should also be noted that over the years, the Tigers themselves have been responsible for scores of grave human rights abuses, including the indiscriminate and deliberate killing of civilians, torture and execution of prisoners, and abductions for ransom, and the forcible recruitment and use of child soldiers. Amnesty International publicly condemned these crimes. Their civilians included both Tamil civilians as well as Sinhalese and Muslim, as well as politicians. A ceasefire went into effect in 2002, but began to unravel in late 2005, and by mid-2006, full-scale war had resumed. Over the next two-year period, between 2006 and 2008, the Sri Lankan government recaptured the tiger-held territory in the east of Delta. Then in 2008, they turned to the, the military turned to the north and undertook Tense offensive that eventually recaptured all the remaining Tiger Hill territory by mid May of 2009. As the film showed, the Sri Lanka's killing fields. In the course of recapturing the remaining Tiger Hill territory, the military committed gross human rights abuses and war crimes. They deliberately and indiscriminately shelled areas that they knew were heavily populated with civilians. They kept adequate amounts of food and medical supplies from entering the war zone thus causing terrible suffering for the trapped civilians. The Tigers also committed war crimes and human rights abuses during the final months. They kept around 300,000 civilians trapped in the war zone and used them as human shields. They shot civilians who attempted to flee the war zone, and they continued to forcefully recruit and use child soldiers. So what's the current situation now for achieving accountability for war crimes and the other abuses? And I'd also like to say a few words about what you can do to help. You should be aware that the Sri Lankan government established an ad hoc Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission in May of 2010 and said it would be the vehicle for accountability. We at Amnesty were very skeptical of the commission. 
fact is, as documented in our report, 20 years of make-believe Sri Lanka's commissions of inquiry. The Sri Lankan government has repeatedly set up temporary commissions of inquiry in response to international pressure on human rights. These commissions have not produced justice for victims, but have merely served to deflect pressure. The lessons learned in reconciliation commission was merely the latest in a long line of such dollars. We also found that this commission didn't have the requisite independence from the government and impartiality to be an effective mechanism for accountability. Amnesty, along with the Human Rights Watch and the International Crisis Group, were invited to testify before this commission, but all three organizations declined to do so. Since we knew the commission was so flawed, it would not provide accountability, and we didn't want to lend it legitimacy by testifying the program. Unfortunately, as it proved in its workings, the commission was deficient as it held periods and took testimony from witnesses. We produced another report called When Will They Get Justice? Failures of Sri Lanka's Lessons Learned in Reconciliation Commission that details these failures. And the amnesty reports, by the way, are available on our website. If you go to amnesty.org and search under Sri Lanka. The Reconciliation Commission issued their final report to President Rajapaksa about a year ago. It was publicly released on December 16th of last year. The Commission's report proved that our concerns about their impartiality and independence were well-founded. They did make some valuable recommendations on several issues other than accountability for war crimes. But when it came to the war crimes issue, the Commission showed that for the most part, they simply accepted what the Sri Lankan military had told them during the hearing, and therefore didn't find any accountability for war crimes on the part of the military, aside from a couple of incidents. The Commission actually acknowledged their inability to determine the facts on some of the critical issues. For instance, who was responsible for shelling the hospitals repeatedly? The government had said the Tigers were responsible for shelling the hospitals, as opposed to the evidence we've seen. The, Sri Lanka, the Commission's report demonstrated that, for, that we really need an impartial international investigation into these crimes for running into accountability. Uh, film Sri Lanka is going through is referred a couple of times to something called the UN panel. You should be aware of what that is. In June of 2010, shortly after the Sri Lankans had set up the Lessons Learned Reconciliation Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General, established a three-member advisory panel of experts to advise him on accountability issues in Sri Lanka. <coughs> Actually, the Sri Lankans set up the commission because they knew Ban Ki-moon was about to set up his panel. And they were trying to do it to head it off, to say, we're doing our own thing, leave us alone, we have our commission. Uh, but Ban set up his panel anyway. Panel took a lot of testimony, or it, didn't, it, it, took, it got a lot of evidence which it considered, and issued its report last year, which was made public in April of last year. The UN panel found that there were credible allegations of war crimes and crimes against humanity, having been committed by both the government forces and the Tigers during the war. The panel, this is the UN panel, recommended that the Sri Lankan government set up effective investigations into these allegations that the UN also set up an international investigation to make sure that there were genuine investigations being done by the Sri Lankans. Ban Ki-moon, after that report came out, said that he didn't have the authority to establish an international investigation by himself. He would need either the consent of the Sri Lankan government, or he would need authorization by a UN body, such as the Security Council, the General Assembly, or the Human Rights Council. None of those bodies has yet provided any such authorization. In March of this year, the UN Human Rights Council did adopt a resolution on Sri Lanka and called on Sri Lanka to formulate a comprehensive action plan to implement the Reconciliation Commission's recommendations and also provide accountability for the violations of international law during the war. The Council's resolution didn't establish an international war crimes it is a good first step. We hope the Sri Lanka the Human Rights Council will, at its next session next March, authorize the establishment of an international investigation. We 
Human Rights Council's resolution also said they wanted the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights to provide technical assistance to the Sri Lankan government. And they wanted the High Commissioner to report back to the Council a year about what, what efforts and what assistance she was able to give the Sri Lankan government. The Sri Lankan government hated that resolution and initially said they would have nothing to do with the High Commissioner coming to Sri Lanka. They subsequently have reversed themselves and have said she is welcome to come and I'll talk to her. I think they're saying that next March it's going to be on the Human Rights Council's agenda again, which they hate. And if nothing has happened in a year, that will allow the U.S. and other countries the ability to say, well, you're not producing any kind of progress, so we need an international investigation. So one of the things the Sri Lankans did after the Human Rights Council, which is the UN body, passed the resolution, was to begin to invite Nabi Hillai, the High Commissioner of Human Rights, to the country. They've also, the Sri Lankan government, issued a national plan of action which commits to limited implementation of some of the recommendations from their own Reconciliation Commission. Their plan relies on the government agencies associated with human rights violations uh, to investigate. Uh, like the armed forces are expected to investigate the human rights abuses and war crimes committed by the armed forces during the war. It doesn't provide for any new or independent body to do this kind of investigation. So we think that the plan by the Chicago government doesn't really demonstrate any political will to account for the war crimes. It simply is another method of providing more process without any substance. Now, just a few words as to what people here in the U.S. can do to help in protection of human rights in Sri Lanka. For one thing, you can join Amnesty International if you're not already. And the material at the end of the table if you're interested, pick that up as how to become a member of Amnesty. And for students, they even weigh dues down to a smaller amount, not the usual $35 or $25. Uh, another 10, please, if you're not already a member of the group, either the bigger NIU group or the law school NIU group, uh, please consider joining. Uh, please also sign the petitions on the table beyond the petition for Perky Dunn and there is another case that AI local group is campaigning on, uh, Raghavar Manaharan, a young Tamil student, uh, part of a group called the Trinco Five. Five students in Trincomalee, which is a city on the north, northeast coast of Sri Lanka. On January 2nd of 2006, they were killed by the security forces. The security forces initially said they were tigers and they were flying something and they got injured, blown up by a hand grenade. Uh, the facts were that they were not tigers, they were shot in the head by the security forces uh, as a part of a deliberately planned effort to teach the Tamils a lesson a few days after some Sinhalese businessmen in Trincomalee had been killed by tigers. This was in 2006, this was six, almost seven years ago. So Amnesty is calling on the Toronto government to prosecute the murderers. We haven't seen any progress. So we have a petition on that case. Uh, we have a petition to Secretary Hillary Clinton, while well, she's still secretary, uh, asking the US to support establishing an international war crimes investigation in Sri Lanka. The US government position right now is that they fully expect the Sri Lankans to do what needs to be done for accountability. The US has said that if the Sri Lankans don't take action in a timely fashion, there may be international pressure to have an international but the U.S. has not given any point time frame and has not said when they might start supporting setting up an international investigation. So we need to keep pressure on the U.S. government to push them along and say, it's been over three years, it's soon going to be four years since the war ended. It's time to have an international investigation. So that petition is on the table as well. Uh, another major issue we also are campaigning on in Sri Lanka is Sri Lanka, during the years of the war, passed security legislation, something called the Prevention of Terrorism Act. They had emergency regulations. These security laws overturned the general criminal code so that, as opposed to having to have a warrant uh, when you arrested someone, 
and give them evidence of, okay, what's the charge, and have to give, produce them before a magistrate within a certain time period, and having the ability to say, if you obtain evidence from them under torture, it's the, it's the burden of proof is on the security forces that it was torture, that it was not torture. The security laws reverse all that. They can arrest you without charge, they can hold you up to 18 months, in fact, they usually ignore that, just keep holding it longer. They, if, if, if you confess while you're in custody, anyone above a certain level of the police is entitled to take your confession. And if you allege in court that your confession was coerced and obtained through torture, the burden of proof is on you to prove you were tortured. And not on the, the government to say, no, you were not tortured. So, What's been happening during the war and since the end of the war, it continues to happen. The Sri Lankan government arrests people without charge or trial. They lock them up. They don't tell the family members where they are. They hold them indefinitely. People do occasionally get out. They get out by bribing the guards, by bribing the system. Uh, and then we find out about them. Sometimes they are released when they get out. Most people who are detained are tortured. Uh, they often the way they prosecute people is through confession, which they obtain through torture. So part of what we are doing, and part of one of our campaigns is on um, this set of laws and on um, these people who are being tortured, and some of them are killed in custody. So we think Sri Lanka needs to repeal the Prevention of Terrorism Act, we need to get rid of the emergency regulations that allow this, we need to prosecute people who are guilty of torturing people, and provide people who have been tortured with compensation. So we, and there are hundreds of people currently still being detained without charge or trial in Sri Lanka. They continue to lock people up and do this, even though the war has been over for a long time. So the petition on the table is on that issue, and that's directed to the Sri Lankan government. Finally, we have a South Asia Regional Action Network. People might be interested in getting ongoing actions, um, amnesties, campaigns, in Sri Lanka or in other parts of South Asia, including Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. You can, join, you can sign up on our sign-up sheet there, and you'll get monthly emails. With that, I think that's the end of my prepared remarks. Thank you for coming, and I'm only here for questions. <coughs> So he was living and working here. Uh, 
Uh, this would come by Rajapaksa. Uh, then his brother Mahinda Rajapaksa gets elected president. Uh, Kodavai had been in the Sri Lankan military before that, before he came to the US. So his brother Mahinda brings him back and becomes defense secretary. So he was an overall charge of the war effort. Uh, the guy who had the army commander at the end of the war, uh, Sarath Fonseca, uh, who later became the opposition presidential candidate, I think has US citizenship. Yeah. Uh, as well. So if he comes here, you could try him. Uh, the Sri Lankan government went after him because he decided to run against Mahinda in 2010. And so after, as he decided to run, they figured out that actually he was guilty of corruption. He was guilty of slander and a whole bunch of violations of the military law. So they put him through a couple of different court marshals and at least one civil case. So he's been in jail a lot. He's out now. But they've been going after him. Uh, Amnesty is saying, you know, this is somebody who himself is army commander who might want to go after if he ever leaves the country. Part of the problem is you have to have jurisdiction uh, if you're not talking about getting Sri Lankan government to you. And get jurisdiction over them, you have to, they have to be leaving the country to do that. Now, Hindu Rajapaksa has gone to the UK a couple times. Uh, and I know there's some effort by some people to try to get him prosecutor while they were there. Uh, some other groups in the U.S. have tried to do civil lawsuits uh, based on the like, Torture Victim Protection Act or the Alien Tort Claim Act here against Mahinda. But those have been thrown out on the basis of as a sitting head of government, head of state, he has to be sovereign again. So they, the U.S. government has, told, has presented a legal brief to the court saying, we don't think you should proceed with the civil case. He's a city president, head of the government, and the state. And so those cases have been tossed out as you know, under diplomatic comedy. You don't go after each other while you're in power. So, um, I fully think this is, a, this is not something that we are going to see uh, dramatic progress on in the short term. It would be great if the UN Human Rights Council does something next March. The fact that we got it on the agenda that that resolution passed last March was a big victory. Because the Sri Lankans lobbied as hard as they could to keep it off the international agenda. They don't want the Human Rights Council thinking about it. Uh, because it allows people like Amnesty, and in fact, the US government was strategic pushing that resolution. They drafted the resolution, promoted the resolution. Not India on the board, which was also key, because India is a major player. You don't want everything coming from the West. You want the South as well, saying this isn't just the West against the South or, or the Third World. This is people who care about human rights, which is not just a Western concept, against human rights violators. So I'm hopeful we'll see something in March that may lead to more problems. Did you have a hand up there? No. I guess ever since the war, um, how are people in Sri Lanka uh, faring now? I mean, do they live in fear of political dissension of any kind? I mean, it's a democratic republic, but it's that, increasing that, that, only, that only says so much, I guess. Uh, the government has been triumphalist. They beat the Tigers. They ended the war. Uh, and they have a lot of support among the Sinhalese majority because of that. I mean, the Tigers are pretty awful. They pioneered, for instance, the use of the suicide vest. They weren't the only ones who did suicide bombers, but they, if you look at the statistics for suicide bombers over, say, the last 30 or 40 years, people think suicide bombing is, you know, uh, Al Qaeda, Islamic, fundamentalist phenomenon. In fact, if you look at the statistics on suicide bombers, the tigers have a lot of them. They weren't religious, they were separatist, and they were targeting Sri Lankans, they weren't targeting for it. Uh, so, part of the, so part of what you need to understand is the Tigers could get suicide bombers any part of the island they chose to. So the capital, even though most of the war zone was in the northeast, and the capital, Colombo, was in the southwest, the Tigers could put suicide bombers in the capital when they wanted to. They killed uh, President Pramadasa, May Day rally, President of Sri Lanka. They killed Rajiv Gandhi uh, in Tamil Nadu, India, another suicide bomber. 
They had, Colombo has its own World Trade Center, and they drove a truck into it and blew it up, where it caused massive damage to it. It caused massive damage to the central bank in Colombo. So people who live in Colombo in the south would say, nowhere is safe. And I send my kids to school, I don't know if they're coming back. Because the bus could be targeted, or they could be caught up in a blast just on the street. So the fact that people have that measure of safety now, don't worry about that kind of uh, bombing going on, uh, is part of what makes the current government so popular. That said, they have cracked down on dissent in a way that more so than they had during the war. Uh, if you're an outspoken journalist, like Pragit, you can be disappeared, you can be harassed. Uh, journalists have been leaving the country because of death threats. Uh, they, human rights defenders are, are leaving the country because they're being targeted. Uh, in fact, uh, over the last couple of weeks, they started an impeachment motion in the parliament against the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court because the reports are that the Supreme Court was ruling against the government on a couple of bills they wanted to have passed. The Supreme Court said it were not constitutional, not consistent with the Sri Lankan Constitution. So what does the Sri Lankan executive do? They bring an impeachment motion in the parliament to impeach the Chief Justice. So the judiciary has been under attack for some time in Sri Lanka. It's getting human rights activists in Sri Lanka to tell us it's, people are more afraid as time has gone on because the government is getting away with it and they continue to get away with it. And as long as they can keep getting away with it, they're going to keep going. They're going to keep centralizing power. So we're on the outside. We, there's only so much we can do here. But part of what I'm trying to do is we'll do what we can here. So we'll draw attention to it, and we'll publicly talk about it, put pressure on, pressure on the US and other governments to speak up. The US government has been helpful uh, on Sri Lanka in the human rights situation. For instance, they did say right after the impeachment motion was tabled that they were, the U.S. was concerned about anything that would threaten the independence of the judiciary. So public is signaling to the Shivangans that the U.S. is not happy with what's going on. So is that, it's, it's not that, unfortunately. I mean, it's better in the sense we don't have the mass killings and the mass bombings. Right. We don't have those things going on. But picking people off here and there, that is still going on. It's getting worse. So, but in the north, the minority areas still. Oh, yes, the same. And then, yes, I was going to remind in the, in the former world, I'll let I'll get I, I have a question. Oh, okay. You're just. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Northeast, where the, war, the final months of the war occurred, it's still very heavily militarized. The government, if you saw the film, you saw the camps that the displaced civilians were put in. The Sri Lankan government made a big deal of closing that camp and moving the final families out right before the Human Rights Council met in November, this past November. In fact, November 1st, they were looking at Sri Lanka's human rights record. Because they wanted to say, look, we've had progress. So part of what they needed to do for the families who were there, which were about 280,000 people, was to do a lot of demining, because there were landmines strewn everywhere in the Northeast. So you couldn't send people back to the villages and tell them to get blown up. You had to go through a demine, and that is very time-consuming, labor-intensive, extremely dangerous. They have been doing a lot of demining. Uh, they've had the military is doing it. They've had help with several NGOs uh, to help them as well. And so they've had people going back to their villages. But it's a little more complicated than that, because some people, if they can get back to the village, they can't necessarily go farming again because what they were doing was they were prioritizing the residential area to demine that first and then move on and demine another residential area. But they weren't demining paddy fields. Well, if you're a farmer, it's great to go back to your village and live in your hut, but you can't go out and work in a paddy field because it'll get blown up. And what do you do for a job and how do you make any money and support your family? So there were a lot of families in the Northeast who were without any kind of means of livelihood. Uh, people were fisher people in the, on the coast. When they had to flee all those times, they